Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us at Modex. <laughs> Who's head spinning at this point after walking around the show? Holy mackerel. Unbelievable. The amount of innovation happening for manufacturers and distributors, warehousers is, is unbelievably tremendous. Thanks for uh, spending a little, couple minutes with us. Uh, we're here to have a conversation, right? And uh, let me grab my little changer here. Uh, my name is Ryan Lynch. Uh, I lead marketing and strategy for Concentric. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but um, it's it's really I'm just emceeing. I'm going to open us, and then we're going to get right into a conversation uh, with two two of our leaders. Um, I've got TJ Shelters over here on the electrification side, right? So TJ spent um, a, a couple of decades leading forklift teams, leading forklift power teams and electrification, as well as actually being in the steel industry and being a production leader, right? So he really understands uh, the types of things you guys go through as operators. And then next to him, I have uh, Howard Gartland. Howard leads our energy storage team. He comes from the critical power space. Howard spent 27 years in the military uh, serving our country as an engineer. Uh, and then he brought that into the utility space as a, a battery leader and led a company called Mesa for 20 years, which joined Concentric three or four years ago. He now leads our energy storage uh, division at Concentric. So really varied team here, right? We got one side of the house on electrification, EVs, those kinds of things, and then the other side, uh, energy security, facility power, critical power. So uh, should be a fun conversation. Um, I'm just going to set the stage. So we, this is about the growing facility power problem, right? And as we've talked to customers this week, there's some teams that are well aware of this. They've already got projects in the hopper for it. Um, but many of us, especially at a facility level, are not really uh, aware yet of what's going on. So I'm just going to set the stage. Uh, this is a very simple graph, actually. You just look at this top line, okay? You start, you, you think about 1950 to the year 2000. Um, you think about us coming out of a war and we got really serious and invested in our utilities and our grid, right? And it opened an unprecedented growth in our country for 50 years. This is essentially the amount of power the big grid was providing the country, all right? Then all of a sudden you get to 2000 and it just stops and it becomes flat. And that's for a bunch of good reasons, efficiency, but we also sent manufacturing overseas and a couple of other things, right? Well now, come 2023, all of a sudden, you can see that we're no longer gonna be at that baseline anymore, right? We have a generation of utilities where their teams have never built new base, base load before, new power at scale, right? They've replaced some, but they've never had to deal with this heavy growth. And all of a sudden, because of data center growth, because of reshoring, because of electrification of EVs, forklifts, et cetera, we are having a, a tremendous growth already start. And if you're, you're still a little leery and say, hey, I, I haven't seen that yet, just think a little bit about the growth and power outages that we're seeing, right? They are, they are growing, uh, the cost of them is growing as well, and it doesn't look like this is gonna change much for the future, right? We don't have enough investment in our utilities to change it in the nearest term. So there's, a, there's more investment gonna be happening, not just at the big grid, but also at the distributed power level in your facilities or near your facilities. So with that, I wanna move on. I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna let these guys run the show. Howard, if I can turn to you, you spent 20 years in the utility space. Can you kind of react to that and talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the market? It's phenomenal that the utilities can't keep up. So what does that mean? The power available to our critical facilities is less available, it's less reliable, the power quality is not as good, and it's more expensive. And what we're gonna talk about today is alternate solutions to help enable electrification of these facilities. Cut through the root of their problems. Number one, they always say labor, right? Labor is the number one problem they have to mitigate, which then leads to production. And as you walk the show, right, how are we solving that problem? Something that's powered, 
right? Whether it's a conveyor, a rack, ASRS systems, whatever it is to, to mitigate those problems, it has to be powered. So when we talk about electrification of forklifts or fleet, we ask about their security plan for the building, right? One, have you looked at your infrastructure? Can it support it? Can you, have you called the utility, right? Do they have the power for you? And then we also talk about their business park or, or future planning of buildings. They tend to forget that their neighbor, right? If you're in a business park and you have a 500,000 square foot warehouse, you're not alone. If your neighbor deploys a solution that pulls from your substation, that's less available power to you, right? So you could wait, Amazon moves in with electric vehicles, right? It could pull power from you. So we're starting to have these conversations with the customer to talk about you know, making sure that they can, they can move product and keep the lights on. But the other issue with facilities and peak power is quality of power, not just intermittent outages, but low voltage conditions, frequency regulation conditions that can wreak havoc on processing equipment, automation systems, and all that kind of thing. We're seeing that increase. And the other big piece is cost. So peak demand charges are rising every utility across the country. And then that's before you pay for electricity, right? In terms of kilowatt hours, you got two two charges on your bill, demand and energy usage. And then those energy uses have time of use tariffs that penalize you for using that power during peak periods. So in our space, it's all about the peak. It's all about limiting and managing that peak to lower the cost and increase reliability in the facilities. Yeah, and, and peak demand in, in interior handling space used to not be talked about very much, right? How, how, why would you have peak demand in our space? You know, lithium is a very big thing in our industry, and what customers sometimes fail to realize is if you go out of opportunity or out of battery changing opportunity charging, which was the mission, right? That's been our mission in a way. On the power side, you want to get one for one, right, on, on batteries and trucks. But if you go one for one, battery down, truck down, lithium seems to solve the problem in, in a better way. But yet now we're seeing customers talk about peak demand, right? So we've seen customers deploy lithium and see 200% spike in their peak demand, right? Because they're all charging on brakes. So it's something that's at the top of mind for the customer and they're looking for solutions. So um, Howard, if you could talk through, so we just talked about all the challenges, but there is some good news on the horizon for all these customers. Can you talk a little bit about that? I could talk forever, I could talk for hours. So a couple of things to think about. One is what's enabling behind the meter, customer sighted technology to be a viable option today, right? And, and the first piece is really around the battery. We're battery people, but the battery is at the hub of enabling renewable penetration, whether it's on the grid or whether it's behind the customer meter. Battery technology has advanced so much in the last 10 years. Lithium batteries, high density, highly reliable, cycle really well, and their costs have come down dramatically over the years. So the battery technology has changed to enable these, these types of technologies. And then number two is the intelligent controls. Right, so now there's intelligent microgrid controllers, EMS systems that can dispatch and manage power for a facility operator to, to maximize the economic opportunity you know, through those controls. And the last piece is maturity in our regulations and our safety standards, and that's really recent, the last four or five years, better UL standards better NFPA standards, all the mitigate any risk associated with, with some of these technologies. So really good advancement in those enablers that make this technology a very viable option for commercial industrial facility operators. We can model what your utility bill is gonna look like if you put in EV chargers or new lithium batteries, that type of thing. And then we can model distributed energy, solar storage type of options behind the meter to show you how to mitigate those increases in the bill. So we call that on-bill savings. Your utility is gonna charge you at 2,000 a month, now you only have to pay 1,000 a month. Secondly, again, recent changes in our regulation allow us to take that stored energy and sell it to the grid, to the grid operators. So you reduce your bill and then you can get a check from the utility. What a great world. <laughs> yeah, so this idea of getting paid for power and distributed power, so I can build energy security into my facility, but then also maybe monetize it. 
Fantastic. So, um, TJ, if you want to talk a little bit, we, we've talked a lot about problems. We're starting to talk about enablers now. Can you give us some examples of solutions that I can deploy today to address these issues? Yeah, absolutely. So, the conversation around solutions are, are they're becoming more complex, right? Especially around energy. Howard mentioned EV charging. So, you know, we've had customers approach us because we're the, the electric vehicle space and say, hey, do you guys do EV charging? We're thinking about deploying it in the parking lot, right? Every customer out there, all of you are going to have to put these EV chargers in. That's more on the grid, right? So the, when we start to talk about solutions with the customer, it goes from, you know, a forklift battery to outside behind the meter very quickly. Um, but some, you know, possible solutions, especially ones we've offered, right? We have taken people out of the battery changing business into lithium. As Howard mentions, we see 20 to 30 percent annual drop in kilowatt hours consumed by the customer, which is great. Still deal with the peak demand. Um, we, we have solar options, right, that are out there today. The customer can go look at solar. You can back it up with an energy storage system. You can completely mitigate your peak demand that way, right? Um, and then there's there's new technology coming. I think we've all walked the show. So, you know, there's a system out there today that, that takes peak demand away from lithium. So it's a reload, a reload system with lithium. So it's taking the battery out of a truck and putting it in, and it allows the battery to charge over a period of time versus seeing peak demand, right? And it takes the operator completely out of um, having to touch the battery, plug it in, any compliance issues. So uh, at the end of the day, the customers are looking for a company that can talk through these things and, and find ways to mitigate them. When we approach a customer, we're talking about an assessment. We're not necessarily talking about their fleet. We have to go look at their infrastructure. Does it have, does a transformer have the capability? Does the substation have the capability? They, again, they kind of look at us cross-eyed, right? And then have you called your utility? You know, what is your consumption? What's your rate? Because we're going to measure that back to you, right? We have to understand what you're paying today to mitigate that tomorrow. Um, and that, you know, that, that conversation kind of gets, when you're a facility leader, you're not used to talking that way, right? You're worried about production, you're worried about moving product. So then you have to bring a consortium in, right? And most companies today have a sustainability initiative, which is great because that's helping drive the conversations. Sustainability officers are engaging with these solutions, solar behind the meter before the facility's thinking about it. So if those two can converge, right, companies move really fast. Great. You're, you're, you're teeing us up here for kind of bringing the show home on, on roadmap. In this case, we're putting in solar storage and controls behind the meter. They don't have to put in a gen set because we provide them the resiliency so it's sustainable, it's, it's user friendly, it's near a residential neighborhood so they don't have to hear the noise. But then the financial piece is really important too. Where now they're doing capital upgrade to their facility. They get a 30 to 40% tax credit year one for installing clean energy systems and there's other incentives out there on the market. So we can make it very financially viable, we can get it done quicker, and we have a cleaner energy solution than what they were gonna get from the utility. Love it. Great. Yeah, and uh, we, we talk about change management a lot, right? So uh, shameless plug on a sales guy, right? So. We, we, instead of pitching the product, we, we talk about it. I ask the customer up front when they're going to go down an advanced solution path, right? If they're going to change chemistries or they're going to go through a complex process, I'll ask them right off the rip, how are you going to handle change management, right? Because you, you've done something the same way for a long time, so what does that look like? And it, al it always gets the customer thinking. And what happens is for speed of execution for you, the customer, you end up having to build a consortium of people, right? So when you look at the problem, who inside of the organization Right, when you're going to go make a change, even if it's lead acid batteries to lithium, or you're going to do solar, who needs to be involved in the project, right? So you can have a sustainability officer, uh, you may have somebody at the, at the back of the house that, that, that control, it could be a procurement, finance, right? You got to get those folks involved, you're going to have to get your facility leaders involved. And if you build a roadmap to what it is that you want to do as a team internally first, you can find a solution provider after the fact, right? Um, and there are companies out there that do both today because uh, that's one of the major challenges. So uh, inside of your facilities today, right, talk to folks, build the roadmap, and then start thinking about the utility, right? If you're going to upgrade your facility over the next five years, right, if you're going to go autonomous vehicles or you're going to put an ASRS in or whatever electrification you're going to do, do you have enough power in your facility? And then does the utility itself provide that power? 
and then what's it going to cost at scale, right? So it's, it's just our recommendation, and customers are doing that today uh, much more frequently, and those customers tend to move a lot faster than those that are dissected inside of their own organizations. Just add a little bit to what TJ said, um, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but it, it's talking to that utility, but then you know there are tools out there, there's companies like ours, uh, and there's several of them that can really help you model what your facility power can look like. There's really good automation tools that can help you look at what your future electric bill is gonna look like, and, and maybe just hammer home too. It's a financial decision, but the, the tax credits, there's accelerated depreciation for capital equipment that's available, and so today, you can put in, you can offset the capital cost by 50 or even 60% of these, of these assets, and they'll be there to provide monetization for 10 to 20 years, depending on how you look at it. So it's not just, you know, solving a problem, it's, it's really becomes an asset to you for your power quality, for your power quantity, but then you can also monetize in several different ways. That's the room. You are able to build a solution that's going to deliver for your people, right? Safer, better environment for the planet, right? We're going to reduce assets. We're going to reduce energy consumption. And then thirdly, you're going to deliver to your profits, right? For us, the word sustainability is really about sustainable operations. And the best projects hit all three of those. So as you're engaged, you're trying to solve a problem, look for solutions that can tell the story of all three of those pieces. Sometimes you want cleaner and you're willing to do a trade-off on costs. Sometimes safety is more important, right? And you got to know which of those are the most important. But thinking about the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profits can really help you build out a roadmap. Um, with that, go ahead. But well, you know what's really frustrating is when you, as the customer, go down a path to, to do a project, and you find that you can't physically do it, right? The infrastructure isn't there. So, again, thinking through all those things, you need to think about it up front. Like that's my encouragement to any customer out there looking to make a change. Yeah, a lot of the customers uh, that, that these teams are interacting with are like one of the ways you know a facility's got a problem is if they're talking about their interconnection with the utility, right? So if you hear that with one of your teams, you know they need to talk to somebody that can think that stuff through uh, with them because those interconnection timelines can be years and years. All right, so um, we're done having this part of the conversation. I'd love to give an opportunity to you to ask questions of this team, so have at it. <laughs>